Go ahead. All right. So we have Arizona State University and University of Arizona, Arizona Eclipse Ballooning Project. With that, take it away. All right. So greetings and salutations from the Arizona Eclipse Ballooning team. My name is Jacqueline Doe. I am the team lead for the Arizona South team comprising of Arizona State University, University of Arizona, and Casa Grande Unit High School. Our team um, traveled to Roswell, New Mexico where we launched two sounding unmanned um, weather balloons, one for the Arizona South team and the other uh, for the Arizona North, North team known as Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Uh, Note to everyone, please don't mind the alien standing the far back in the picture. As you can see here in this image, we were a long way from home after launching the first balloon. Our original plan was to launch both balloons back to back, Arizona South at 9.40 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time, and 50, min 50 minutes later, Arizona North at 9.55 a.m. For the second balloon, we increased the gas flow from 120% to 130% to ensure the out expected altitude anywhere between 75,000 to 80,000, which at maximum totality at 10.41 a.m. Both our teams had all the payloads tied in an hour before the launch time. But that did not really happen with the first balloon. Murphy's Law, right? We accidentally underfill it, resulting at an average ascent rate of one to two meters per second, total flight time of three hours and 45 minutes, and a total distance of 187 miles, surpassing the original predicted landing site from the border of New Mexico and Texas to east of the Highway 27 and the city of Abernathy, Texas. Despite the arduous journey, we can confidently brag about our payloads exploring three states, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. Hello, my name is Megan Miller from ASU. What you're looking at right now is the vertical velocity in meters per second over time. Like Jacqueline said, it stays within one to two meters a second during ascension. During minute 220, the balloon burst, you can observe that the velocity decreases significantly due to the payload, payloads falling. Then the parachute deploys, and with this data, though we are moving slowly, you can see that we are moving consistently proving that our data will be consistent. Next slide. This is showing the gyroscope on the Z axis, displays the spin of our payloads. This shows that the RPM of our payloads is around two to four revolutions per minute. This shows the stability of our payloads before the burst was consistent. One other thing that I would like to note is that the average g-force is around 16. Though it's not shown in this data, it's an important to note this effect. Next slide. Hello, my name is Ricardo Antiveros, and I'm from the I'm from Arizona State University. This is a chart of our atmospheric data from our pterodactyl sensor board. As you can see, there is a relationship between temperature, pressure, and altitude. As our balloon ascends, it first crosses through the troposphere. Here, the temperature and pressure steadily decrease as we climb. However, once a balloon begins to enter the stratosphere, you see something that's a little counterintuitive. The temperature in green actually begins to increase. This is due to an increase in the absorption of ultraviolet radiation by the ozone layer. Uh, so our balloon steadily increase until it reached its peak altitude at about 87,000 feet or 26 and a half kilometers, about three hours into our flight before it burst. Next slide, please. Hi, I'm Courtney from the Arizona State University team. Um, so for the ground station, our goal was essentially to um, have as strong and stable of a connection as possible for as much of the flight as possible. A few of our setbacks in achieving this um, included uh, during test launches, our signal range was unacceptable. Um, and whenever we were connected, um, we had insufficient throughput leading to uh, video artifacting and just poor video quality overall. Um, to remedy this, we utilize the Ubiquity Wi-Fi Man Wizard, um, which is a spectrum analyzer um, pictured there uh, to determine an optimal operating frequency um, prior to flight. Um, this helped to make sure that we uh, uh, were choosing a frequency that wasn't so crowded um, so that we can get uh, stable video. Um, and then we also increased our tracking precision 
make sure that the dish was pointed um, as squarely as possible at our payloads. Um, the outcome of uh, these solutions um, led to a dramatic increase of uh, connection duration and uh, primarily clean, stable video. Next slide. Uh, hello, my name is Crystal Lopez, and I'll be presenting on behalf of the ASU mechanical team about our current payload housings. Our goal is to create a reusable and durable payload housings that will be able to survive potential high velocity crashes. For the iridium housing, the dark blue components were made of TPU or thermoplastic polyurethane to observe the shock distributed from the light blue parts in the black lid, which were made of PETG or polyethylene terephthalate glycol. Uh, next slide. Uh, due to the weight and volume constraints, we used extruded polystyrene, or better known as XPS, in both thickness of five millimeter and one half inch to design a foam housing for a Raspberry Pi system. Next slide. Hello, my name is Serena Blanchard and I'm from the U of A team. This is our RFD 900 housing that we designed. We decided to go with a 3D printed design due to its high reusability and durability. Um, phone payloads tend to absorb damage easier and will deform after many launches. However, ours is really strong and it um, lasted through all of our test launches and the actual eclipse. We use PETG about 40% infill. It fluctuated um, based on how long we had to print it. Um, there were some issues, however, with our 3D printed design. Typically, um, 3D printed designs have high fracturability and cracking. And so to counteract this, we added foam to all the fracture points. Another downside was that it was a 50 hour print. So it was pretty painful to print everything. Um, so it was nice that we didn't have to a lot. We designed it to be round and conical to fit the build plate and allow space for antennas underneath the build plate. If you see, the build plate has tabs and the base suspended those tabs and then the lid slitted, slotted right above it. And then we attached everything with zip ties. Next slide. Hi, my name is Andrew. I'm with the U of A mechanical team. For the um, pterodactyl, we had a square build plate so we designed a square housing for it. Um, it didn't have any tabs to be slotted into a base, so we designed a small shelf for it to sit on, and then we secured it with zip ties. Those zip ties were then slotted into and covered by the foam that we put around all the fracture points. Um, we also included a small base below the build plate for the battery that also doubled as a possible um, impact absorption area. Um, with the lid not being able to slot into the bottom, we um, only connected it with zip ties. And when we did in um, encounter fracture issues, um, the only part that would generally come apart was if it wasn't the tie-in points was the lid would come detached. Next slide, please. Hi, I'm Mohammed from the ASU team. Over the course of the integration and testing, members of the Arizona Eclipse team with the help of Desiree also made sure we get back to the community by teaching the orbital science behind solar eclipses and their implications. This is the list of universities that we reached out to. Uh, we also held engaging presentations and demonstrations using our hardware. Our most successful presentations were inspiring the students at the Eastern New Mexico University the day before the launch of the annual eclipse and the ASU crowd at the viewing party on the day of the launch. Members of the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University also assisted us. Now I have my teammate Emily who set up the viewing party to share more information. Hey, I'm Emily Addison from ASU and I helped lead the eclipse viewing party on October 14th here at ASU. Um, like I mentioned, this was a really successful event thanks to our collaboration with other ASU clubs and organizations. We had about 400 attendees and we were able to live stream our eclipse footage from the rest of the team in New Mexico, distribute eclipse classes and educate the public on solar eclipses and the NEBP project. Here's some information about our social media. We're active on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. So please check us out. Our Instagram is AZ Eclipse Ballooning. We'd love to connect with you, especially the other NEBP teams. 
So moving forward, um, as we're getting closer to the total eclipse launch, um, we're going to start implementing the mechanical vent system as we did fly earlier for the annual eclipse. Uh, we're going to improve on the lift precision, making sure that it will not have an arduous um, three hour, 45 minute long um, flight. And last but not least is optimized video quality. Uh. And we would like to thank um, the Stratospheric Ballooning Association, National Eclipse Ballooning Project, and also our mentors from Arizona State University, um, University of Arizona, uh, Casa Grande Union High School, Embry-Riddle, Arizona Near Space Research, and also Arizona Space Grant Consortium. Thank you very much. And please follow us on Instagram at AZ Eclipse Ballooning. And that concludes right. the presentation. Very nice. Thank you. Any questions? We've got a couple minutes. Yes, I have, I have a question. A, what kind of I, inertial measurement unit were you using to uh, uh, determine the ascent rate, descent rate, uh, rotation about the Z axis? You know? Could you repeat the question? Sorry. Yes, you're using an inertial measurement unit, an IMU, I assume, to uh, determine the ascent rate, the descent rate. I noticed you had rotation about the z-axis. Uh, can you comment on what you used? Do you know? I believe so, that I was on the pterodactyl board. Uh, Megan, maybe probably you know the specifics. Yes, this was an in internal measurement on the pterodactyl board. This was oh. taken st the straight data from what we were gotten. Um, but for the vertical velocity, that was determined from the altitude, as our vertical velocity data was like corrupt. Um, when it was plotted, it was just a little wonky, so we derived it from the altitude. Oh, okay. And just to jump in very quickly, we, we did wind up using a LSM 9DS1 accelerometer, so there's three axis of motion. Um, it's just a typical one up from, from Adafruit is what we use on our pterodactyl board. Okay, thank you, very nice talk. A quick there was another comment. question. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Um, you have to be careful with those low ascent rates. Um, I had a, <clears throat> I launched a balloon for a student team in uh, Al Alabama, and after I weighed the payloads, another student hooked another one on that I wasn't aware of. And when we launched it, we went up at one meter per second, and uh, it went seven hundred miles down range, took six hours, and landed in the Atlantic Ocean. So. <laughs> Uh, thank, you. thank you for the recommendation. But, and it is, it is possible to intentionally float a latex balloon with the same technique uh, if it's a 1200 gram balloon or bigger and a uh, lightweight payload under about a half pound. If you go up uh, one meter per second or less, it will float. Yeah, so we, um, we did our lift calculation correctly. However, when we attached the weights um, to the, the the neck of the balloon, just to make sure that we have enough lift. We were mistaking the half a pound weight plate for a pound weight plate. So that altered a lot immensely. And when we saw, um, yeah, our ascent rate was going up, we we're like, oh no, it is a floater. And we were nervous that it would be traveling not only to Texas, but probably another state over. But thankfully it, it stopped in Texas. And good thing we had, when we found out our sandway was like going really slow. We already have recovery team on route heading um, heading east of Texas. And we didn't wait for like the balloon to burst and then start retrieving the payloads. Yeah, we've had several go 800 miles or more uh, on a latex balloon. <laughs> so that that is epic. So you, you beat us in a way. So how high was it when the eclipse actually came by? That was not labeled on the altitude yeah. graph. Correct. So it actually went up when totality happens um, at maximum about 22,000 feet. Um, we we were nowhere in the stratosphere as we were hoping, like as I say, 75,000, 80,000 feet. So a note from Angela in the chat, this is for everybody actually, and that is when you do outreach, fill out her form. She's trying to keep records oh. of who's doing it, what outreach. And I think she's very pleased with what she's been hearing. Perfect. We'll do. We'll get it. Um, we'll get some documentation. Um, I remember that link that you guys sent out to us. Any other questions? Okay. Um, 
great job. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. And uh, yeah, thank you.